I start. Uh, so the design project has been posted. It's officially due on December 12th. Um, actually, I, I know that's during the, the RRR week. Um, uh, the only reason I'm making it do that late is just to give you more time. But I, I think that you should, if you, in principle, you should be able to finish it well before that week. So if you don't want to work on the project during that week, you should be able to turn it in easily earlier, OK? Um, but I know that for the graduate students, they're going to be giving presentations on their project during that week. So some of the undergrad students might want to watch and learn from their presentations to finalize their project write-ups, OK? Um, the next quiz will be next Tuesday, beginning of class. And you should have, yeah, so it's a quiz five, so you'll have five pages of notes allowed. It's really just going to cover maybe some qualitatively the non-ideal behaviors in an MOS capacitor and then just the basics of a MOSFET. OK, right, questions, uh, Lewis? So that's like gate depletion, effect of oxide charge, <laughs> qualitative. Well, OK, threshold voltage, uh, maybe adjustment by ion implantation. You might have to calculate like the dose of an implant. Like you have to. to you might have to indicate if you wanted to imp uh, implant boron or arsenic to tune the threshold voltage you know, to a certain level. Yeah. So main, primarily qualitative. Okay. And then for the MOSFET, uh, there'll probably be some minimal calculations. Okay. Similar to past uh, exams. Okay. So that's for next week. This week we're just going to finish up the uh, MOS transistor. Um, so last week uh, we covered. Uh, or sort of derive an equation that the propagation delay, so the amount of time it takes for a digital circuit to perform a function is going to be uh, proportional to the amount of capacitance that you have to charge or discharge at the output of your logic gate. And it's going to depend on the, the voltage that you want to charge it up to um, or discharge it from. And the speed at which you can charge or discharge the capacitor at the output node is going to depend inversely on the amount of current that your transistors can conduct. Okay. So clearly, if we can lower the capacitance, lower the voltage, or increase the current, then we can have faster digital circuit operation. Now, for analog operation, um, we'd like to have, uh, first of all, higher gain. Like for an analog amplifier, we'd like to have higher gain. And it turns out that transconductance, this is part of the homework this week, um, the higher your transconductance, in other words, the, the more current change you can induce with a gate voltage change, um, the higher the gain of your circuit. So you would like to actually maximize transconductance. And notice the transconductance depends on the inversion layer charge density, but also uh, is proportional to W over L, width over length. And the maximum frequency at which you can operate a transistor or circuit with gain is the cutoff frequency. And again, key thing here is the cutoff frequency is it is going to depend on the amount of time. It's, it's uh, proportional to the amount of time it takes for an electron to drift across the channel. So the shorter the channel length, the higher the, the, the shorter the time it takes, so the higher the frequency you can operate your transistor at. So bottom line is if you can scale down the size of, of your transistor, especially the channel length, you should be able to increase the speed of a digital logic circuit, in, improve the gain of an analog circuit, and also improve the frequency range for amplification. So today's lecture is going to focus on transistor scaling, OK? And weird things that happen, well, some non-ideal things that come up. When you scale the transistor to very short channel lengths, uh, two things, velocity saturation, because the lateral electric field becomes so high that you hit the uh, limit, the saturation velocity limit. And then also there's some short channel effects when the channel length um, gets to be too short. OK, so let's first talk about, let's see, I'm not sure how to. There's a latch, but I'm not tall enough to reach that. OK, thank you. OK, great. So don't get hurt. So transistors, as you might know, have been steadily scaled down in lateral dimensions over the last few decades, OK, since the, well, since Moore's observation. So it's been about five decades now. In the 1970s, um, it was starting out at about tens of micron, about 10 micron channel length. Today, the shortest transistors used in any product is, is about 25 nanometers. And that's manufactured by Intel Corporation in its um, state-of-the-art microprocessors. So the benefits, well, not only can you, if a transistor is smaller, you can fit more of them in a single um, area, let's say square centimeter. So you can actually have a chip perform more functions. And the cost of making a chip is not 
increasing too much as you go from one generation of technology to the next. So you end up with um, better functionality of a chip because you have more devices on there and you can have lower cost per function. Um, so if we scale down the channel length, we can improve the circuit operating speed, as I just mentioned at the beginning. And uh, basically, you, in this, this is for digital logic circuits, it's because you can conduct more current. Esen essentially, you have less on-state resistance. See, when a, when a transistor is, let's say the NMOS device is turned on to discharge this output node to ground, um, when it's on, it has some effective on-state resistance. So that on-state resistance gets lower if you can conduct more current for a given voltage. Um, and then if the size of the transistor, the width and the length, and the size of your gates is smaller, then you have less capacity. Also, if the source and drain regions are not as long because you're shrinking down the size of the transistor, you have less junction capacitance. And if you have smaller transistors, you can pack more of them closely together. So the length of these interconnect wires is shorter, so you have less capacitance as well. Okay, so for digital logic circuits, there are definitely great benefits in scaling down the size of the transistor. So in the first few decades, the industry scaled down the size of the transistors pretty much, um, if, you, if you look at this, the cross-section uh, of the transistor structure, it looks proportionately similar. Right? It just looks like a, a smaller version of the transistor in the previous generation. Okay? So that's kind of, that kind of worked for a few decades. Um, so notice here that the key things we're scaling down are the transistor gate length, we'll call this LG, and that's pretty well correlated to the electrical channel length, I'll we'll call that L, okay? The, so technically, channel length is uh, the separation between the source and drain junctions. So the, so the, on the next page, we'll just show you the scaling rules. So basically, um, uh, I think it was uh, uh, Dr. Denard at L IBM Microelectronics, they many years ago s proposed a scaling methodology where um, in the next generation of technology, all the dimensions scale, the physical dimensions scale by this some constant factor. So here in this slide, it's called kappa. So we have kappa is just greater than one. So in other words, L over kappa is less than L. So let's say kappa, well, it's about 1.1 1 .1 and a half or something like this. So 1 over kappa historically has been about 0.7. OK, so basically 1 over kappa squared is about 1 half, right? Because basically you're doubling the, the number of transistors that you can fit in a single area, in a given area, with each generation of technology. Okay, so let's look at the next slide. Um, so this is the uh, constant field scaling methodology summarized here. So if we look at the channel length and the width, with the, from one generation to the next, we are scaling down those dimensions by one over kappa. So let's say, you know, around 0.7. Okay. Um, the dopant concentration Okay, let's, let's skip that for now. The voltage, okay, if you make a transistor smaller, um, ideally you don't want to apply the same voltage across a shorter distance because you'll increase the electric field. Okay, so you really don't want to end up having higher and higher electric field across your device um, for, as you scale it down. So we also want to scale the voltage proportionately. Okay, so the key here is that this constant, so this is why it's, con it's called constant field. It's because the voltage scales together with the lateral dimension. Okay? So that's, that's the key. Um, so ideally, if you'd like to scale the depletion width by the same factor, right, so let's go back here. See the, the width of this depletion region? We'd like to scale that also by kappa, you know, reduce it by a factor of one over kappa. So if the depletion layer width has to scale by one over kappa, then the dopant concentration needs to increase. Okay, so that's why we have increasing dopant concentration to shrink the size of the depletion uh, region. Okay, the gate capacitance is proportional to the, the width and the length. Now each of those is gonna be scaled down, but the thickness of the oxide is also being scaled down.
oh yeah, right here. So the thickness of the oxide is also being scaled down. So that increases the capacitance per unit area, but the area is decreasing faster. So overall then, the, the total gate capacitance, so this is like the gate capacitance, which is equal to the permittivity divided by the oxide thickness times the area, that also decreases. Okay, so the current, the current that, if you shrink the size of a transistor, the current actually will go down also um, because the width is going down um, and the voltage is going down, so you have less inversion layer charge density. Well, actually, no, you don't. You have the inversion layer charge density, um, coulombs per centimeter squared stays the same. But as you change the width of the transistor, you can reduce the current. So overall, the current for a smaller transistor is also going to scale down. But that doesn't matter because Remember, delay is proportional, is equal to the capacitance times the voltage over the current, right? So if the capacitance decreases by 1 over K and the voltage decreases by 1 over, K, 1 over K, it's okay for the current to also decrease by 1 over K. The delay improves, uh, it, sh it scales down by 1 over K. So if the delay is smaller, that means your circuit is faster. So bottom line is for constant field scaling, you get faster circuit operation. You get um, lower power, okay, let's see, power. The power, okay, the power that you consume is proportional to the voltage times the current. The power goes down by uh, kappa squared, okay, but you fit more transistors per unit area to exactly compensate for that. So the power density ideally stays the same. As you, as you advance technology. Because um, you're fitting, even though you're fitting more transistors in a given area, each transistor is burning um, less, less power. So overall, your chip is not going to get you know, overly hot when you operate the device. Okay? So the key here is that the circuit speed improves. Okay? That's a benefit of scaling. And the energy efficiency actually goes up. It improves because the amount of power you dissipate to perform a single function is actually lower. But you perform more functions per unit area, so the power density stays constant. Okay? So this is, actually this is an important benefit of constant field scaling. Okay, but in the last decade or so, um, the, we have not been able to follow constant field scaling. And the, for, the, for the reason that the supply voltage has not been scaled down proportionately, like in the previous slide. Okay, um, so remember if we plot current on a log scale, log of the drain current versus the gate voltage, remember it looks something, there's a sub-threshold regime, and then above the threshold it looks, it's a linear function of gate voltage, so it kind of looks like this. Um, so remember the on-state current, uh, let's call ID sat, is proportional to uh, Vg minus Vt to some power, okay, like two, perhaps. So if we, if we want to have reasonable drive current um, when we reduce the, okay, so the, the maximum, um, okay, ID sat, so the maximum current, uh, the maximum voltage you can apply to the gate is VDD, okay. So if we want to scale down the power supply voltage but have reasonable circuit speed, that means we have to scale down the threshold voltage as well. Okay, so that voltage scaling is sort of assuming that, yeah, v, VDD goes down, but then VT should also go down proportionately so that you can maintain good, you know, some reasonable drive current. Okay, but if we make the VT too small, then as we covered last time, I'm just gonna exaggerate. If VT is really small, right, moving this way, right, this is decreasing voltage, then the off-state leakage, right, the current flowing at zero is going to be too high. So in recent, in the last decade or so, the supply voltage, it's been difficult. Today, it's, a, it's around 1.0 volts. Okay, so at 30, about 30 nanometers, power supply volt uh, is around 1 volt. And the gate oxide thickness is about 2 nanometers. Oxide fuel is uh, approaching, okay, so it's like 5 megavolts per centimeter. Okay, so what's happened is because the threshold voltage cannot really be scaled too close to zero, 
Dt is greater than 0.2 volts or so, 0.2, 0.25 volts. Um, the VDD, the supply voltage, has not been scaled down proportionately to, even though we've been continuing to miniaturize or pack more transistors per unit area. So what that has done is it has re resulted in increased electric field, unfortunately. Um, so what the industry has followed in the last 10 years or so is a more, what they call a generalized approach, where they allow the electric field to increase. So it's not constant field, but it increases by some factor um, greater than one each generation. And, and as we'll study in, in a few, in a little while, um, basically if you have a large, if you have a larger voltage than you normally want across the PN junction, remember the drain junction in the off state is reverse biased. Okay, so, so you really don't want to have the width of the depletion region to be too large if you, I mean, you want to scale it down as you scale down the um, channel dimensions. But if you're, if you're applying an even higher voltage than you really want, then that means your depletion width is um, larger than you really want, right? The reverse bias voltage will increase the depletion width. So you have to compensate for that by increasing the doping of your channel region, your, your body region, even more aggressively than for the constant field scaling approach. Okay, um, this is basically to um, maintain uh, small, or, or basically to scale the width of the depletion region. Okay. Okay, this, this depletion depth, right? So if the voltage is not really scaling proportionately, then, then that means the depletion depth won't be scaling proportionately, but you can force the depletion depth to um, scale by increasing the doping in the body. Okay. So the key here is that if you don't scale the voltage as aggressively, so you allow the electric field to increase, then the bottom line is, the bottom line is your power density, oops, depending if we have velocity saturation or not, power density goes up. Okay, so that's why I have this bullet here. Um, in recent generations of technology, people have started to worry about power, CMOS power density because the supply voltage um, is, is starting to be a problem. As you, the, if you can't scale much below one volt, then the power density goes up when you substantially when you fit more and more transistors in a given area. Okay, and the fact that you have higher electric fields in your semiconductor may cause like breakdown or some other deleterious effects, and so reliability, your device might degrade faster um, over time if you're operating at higher electric fields, okay? All right, so that's basically, and so next time we'll talk about advanced transistor structures can, which can help alleviate this problem a little bit, okay? Okay, so that's kind of an overview of MOSFET scaling. Let's talk about what happens, or that, that's the motivation, right, for scaling the, the channel length um, in a, in a systematic manner to achieve improvements in performance and energy efficiency um, with technology advancement. But some things, uh, some non-ideal effects come into play when you make the transistor too short in the channel length. Okay, so the first thing is velocity saturation. So does anybody remember what velocity saturation, or what typically what is the maximum velocity, oh actually it's on the slide. Well, what, what causes this? I, I answered it in um, extra questions, I guess. Uh, let's call this E, let's say the lateral electric field. Yeah, so some, some kind of scattering. So the question was asked in class and I answered it like after class with some extra notes. But basically, um, if, if you have a higher and higher electric field, then the carriers will gain more and more kinetic energy before they scatter, in between scattering events. And once you gain enough kinetic energy it's on the order of 60 millil electron volts in, in silicon. Um, you can actually, the electron when it scatters with the lattice can actually generate an optical phonon, which is when you cause atoms to vibrate like this way rather than kind of like this way. Um, and that actually, uh, so basically the electrons can lose their energy very effectively once they are, have enough kinetic energy to, to generate optical phonons. Um, so optical vibration, phonon vibration modes in your lattice. So this kind of scattering becomes very efficient once you reach a certain um, saturation velocity. So basically, oops, E, C, 
that. This happens when the lateral electric field is pretty high. And that happens when, OK, let's say now we're scaling down the size of the transistor, the channel length. And we're not scaling down the voltage so aggressively. So basically, the lateral electric field is, is increasing as we scale down the size of the transistor. And once we go b below like a quarter micron or so, we start to see the velocity saturating. Okay, so in the equations for transistor current, remember, we sort of assumed that the velocity is proportional to the lateral electric field. Remember that? So that's true only at low lateral electric fields, right? So now, if you make the transistor channel length really short, you're operating at higher lateral electric fields, and you no longer can use this simple equation for, you, you can't use this equation for the drift velocity anymore. So the drift velocity um, actually, rather than being equal to mu times E of the electric field, you have to account for saturation. and the simple model to account for velocity saturation is given on this slide. So basically, you just have to add this denominator factor, okay? So that basically, once you have the le lateral electric field coming close to the saturation electric field, the mobility, the slope starts to degrade. And then for, this, this is for electric fields below the saturation electric field. And then once you reach the saturation electric field, then the velocity is just constant at the saturation velocity. So it's a simple, simple model, okay? So I think I mentioned last time, if, if you have a small, if you have, a, let's say, a poor mobility, or well, let's just say a higher mobility, material that has a high, higher mobility, the saturation velocity for the a given material is the same. Let's say you have it more lightly doped or something. So mobility is higher, so the slope is steeper, but the maximum value is still roughly the same. So that means that the saturation electric field depends depends on the mobility, right? Okay, so the higher the mobility, the sooner you're going to see velocity saturation as, as you increase the lateral electric field. So that's why the saturation um, electric field depends inversely on mobility, okay? Um, and then for silicon, uh, for holes, and electrons is slightly different values. But close to, you can remember, it's, you know, close to 10 to the 7 per centimeters per second. Okay, so the key here is uh, use the same equation as before for the, in the linear regime, um, but just add this extra denominator factor. Okay, so that's what we do here, right? We, we have this extra factor at the bottom. Oh, okay, so what is the lateral electric field? In the linear regime, before the channel is pinched off, it's just the voltage dropped across the inversion layer, which is VDS, divided by the channel length, L. Okay, so this right here, that's the lateral electric field. Okay, so this equation, hopefully you recognize, is just the same as before, except now, um, yeah, instead of, you have mu F, the mu times the lateral electric field, which is VDS divided by L, but then you have this extra denominator factor, in, okay? So that's pretty straightforward. Let's, let's, um, let's figure out then um, when this actually occurs, okay? I mean, when, when this, so what, what impact does this have on the current versus voltage um, characteristic? So ID, versus VD. Normally, it looks something like this, right? What, what, is, what is this VD sat value t normally? V minus, well, VGS minus VT corrected um, due to the body effect, right? Normally, that's for a long channel MOSFET. Okay, so the current in a MOSFET can saturate if you reach, if the, if the inversion layer reaches pinch off, right? If the, if the inversion layer is pinched off at the drain, as you, okay, so as you increase the drain voltage, if, if you increase the drain 
voltage too much such that the channel gets pinched off, you can reach, you can saturate the current. Okay? But you can also reach saturation in current if you if the carriers are are reaching the maximum velocity. Okay, so there's two two different mechanisms that can limit that can limit um, the velocity of your carriers. Okay? And the one that is most stringent, uh, most limiting, is the one that has more dominant effect on the saturation voltage. Okay, so it's because you have two mechanisms that are limiting, it's kind of like mobility. So you have different mechanisms that are limiting mobility. So to get the, the overall mobility, you have to add their, you know, the inverses and take the inverse. Right? So same thing here, uh, to find the saturation, the drain saturation voltage, or the, the, vol the drain voltage at which the current reaches a maximum, you have to account for both mechanisms. It can be, you can, it can actually be due to pinch off or due to velocity saturation. Whichever one occurs earlier, that's going to be the one that, that um, first causes the current to, to saturate, okay? So basically you have this first term on the, in this equation on the right, that first term is just the, the voltage at which, so this is VD at pinch off. And this is, oops, this is one over VD. And this is one over VD at um, V equals V sat. Does that make sense? So to find out what the real actual VD sat is, you just basically take, you have to add those together and then take the inverse. Okay. So let's do a simple um, example. And oh, okay. So notice the saturation drain voltage depends on the on a few things. It depends on the gate overdrive. Okay, so gate overdrive is just VGS minus VT. Okay, so it depends on the gate overdrive, um, and that makes sense, right? Because the the more inversion charge density you have, the harder it's going to it's going to take more drain voltage to pinch it off to pinch off the channel at the drain end. Okay, and it also depends on the channel length. Okay, the shorter your channel length the sooner you're going to reach saturation, I mean the saturation electric field. Okay, so those, those are two things we're gonna consider in this example. Okay, so for a fixed, okay, in this case, a fixed gate overdrive, right, so VGS is 1.8 volt, for a threshold voltage of a quarter volt, um, let's calculate what is the saturation voltage for these different channel lengths. Okay, so we, you can look up for for this particular value of VT and um, oxide thickness and gate voltage, um, you can figure out what the effective electric vertical electric field is, the average vertical electric field in the inversion layers. That, that's how you find out what mobility is. Then you can actually calculate what the saturation electric field is. So notice that the saturation electric field is usually 10 to the fifth, 10 to the five volts per centimeter or, or less depending on the mobility, okay? And the only reason we gave you the, the maximum depletion depth is to calculate that body um, charge factor, M. Okay, so we have this equation now for the saturation uh, drain voltage. Let's just plug in the numbers for different channel length, okay? So for a very long channel length, just qualitatively, um, which, mechanism do you think will be dominant? Um, pinch off or velocity saturation? If it's a long channel length, pinch off, right? Yeah, because if it's a long channel length, you need like a really high voltage to reach the saturation electric field. Yes, so in the long channel example, part A, the, the drain saturation voltage is 1.3 volts, which is equal to VG minus VT, and that's the pinch off voltage. But as you go to shorter and shorter channel lengths, you see that um, for the shortest channel length in this example, 50 nanometers, the, um, the saturation voltage is pretty much uh, equal to, pretty much equal to the voltage needed to reach the saturation electric field, okay? Uh, let me see. Okay, so the question is, okay, how about, what? so this was an example for a given VGS 
of 1.8 volts. So VGS minus VT is over a volt. Um, if you have VGS that's smaller, so let's say you have less gate overdrive. So v VGS is not so high, um, so you have less inversion charge density. What do you think will happen to this analysis? Which, how is that going to affect which um, current saturating mechanism is dominant? If you have less gate overdrive. Well, does it become easier to pinch off or harder to pinch off when you have lower VG? Yes, Jeff. Easier to pinch off, right? Because you have less inversion charge density. So it's easier to pinch off. So, so VD sat. Um, the, the normal pinch off voltage will be lower. So actually, um, a device actually, if you operate a, a, a transistor with a lower gate voltage, it looks a little bit more like a long channel MOSFET. So, it, so it's, in this class, if I say, okay, is this a short channel MOSFET? It's, the answer actually depends on the gate overdrive as well as the gate length, the channel length, um, because this, this, um, the saturation might still be due to pinch off um, if the gate voltage is really low, okay? All right. Anyway, it's just a matter of terminology. So I'll try to be really clear when I ask the questions, <laughs> okay? Okay, so that's in the, uh, the equation on the previous slide was just for the linear regime of operation. So what about the saturation, um, saturation current itself? So what we just calculated in this example, as we, if we plot current versus strain voltage, you know, ordinarily, you know, it looks something like this. And here's VD sat. Um, we calculated this value of VD sat. Now the question is, what about this current ID at saturation? Okay. Um, so this qualitatively, if if the saturation voltage due to pinch, okay, if the saturation voltage is actually decreased for short channel devices uh, because of the velocity saturation effect, um, what do you think will happen to the, wh how should that be reflected in the current? Will the current increase or decrease? Uh, yeah, increase or decrease? It'll decrease, right? Because you're, you're reaching saturation at a lower strain voltage, you're not gonna be able to reach you know, as high of a saturation current. So that's exactly, okay, so that's what's shown on, on this slide here. If we substitute the equation for the, the VD sat from the previous slide into the equation for I, the drain current, um, you'll end up with this equation here for um, the saturation current. Okay, and it turns out that it's just the exact same equation as for a long channel device as we had in last, last week derived. But again, you have some factor in the denominator that's greater than one, so you're degre degrading the drive current. And this, this uh, factor here depends on the gate overdrive as well as the channel length, okay? Now let's take the extreme. Let's say that the channel length is really small so that the saturation electric field times the length, okay, that's the, that's the drain voltage needed or that, that's the drain voltage at which you reach saturation velocity. Let's say that this is small compared to this, VGS minus VT over M. Okay, so in other words, this whole, uh, this whole thing here is much greater than one. Okay, so that's like if, if the channel length is really, really small. Okay, so if the channel length is really, really small, then you can deduce that the current is just going to be given by the width. Actually, let's write this down. The current, this is just equal to the width times the saturation velocity times the inversion layer charge density. Okay, and that should hopefully be obvious. I mean, this is coming back to where we started, <laughs> um, right? The, the width, the amount of current that a transistor can conduct in the on state going to be proportional to the width of the channel, it's going to be proportional to inversion layer charge density, and it's going to be proportional to the velocity of the carriers. 
And in a very short channel device, the average velocity is just going to be the saturation velocity. Okay? Pretty, pretty simple. But um, the interesting thing here is notice, remember I sh mentioned this uh, factor, um, this power factor eta, right? So for a short channel, a very short channel device, the current is proportional to VGS minus VT. The, the saturation current is proportional to VGS minus VT, not VGS minus VT quantity squared. Okay, so for a very short channel device, this power factor is one. For a long channel device, that power factor is two. Okay? So let's, let's review why. Okay, so why is that? So re let's remember why, why, um, why is that, why, for a long channel device, why does the saturation current depend on VGS minus VT quantity squared? Do you remember? Yeah, okay, so for a long channel device, the velocity, the average velocity still depends on VGS minus VT, right? Because the maximum voltage you can apply across this inversion layer, um, the, the voltage at the pinch off is VGS minus VT, well, scaled by M, right? So as you increase the gate to uh, VGS minus VT, you can increase the velocity of the carriers because you're increasing the, the voltage applied across the inversion layer. And as you increase VGS minus VT, you're increasing the inversion charge density. So here, for us, in the case of velocity saturation, it doesn't matter if you can increase VGS minus VT. Um, I mean, it doesn't matter if you can increase the electric field across the inversion layer. It's just going to be, it's already hit the maximum value. Okay? So that's fundamentally the difference. And so uh, notice that the current it's actually no longer dependent on L. Okay, so if you scale down the channel length, you're not going to increase the current anymore. Okay, but it's still worthwhile to scale the size of the transistor because the load capacitor goes down, right? The capacitance in your circuit can go, still go down, so your circuit can operate faster. But the improvement in speed won't be as much because you're no longer getting more current uh, benefit by scaling the channel length down. Okay, so this is a classic um, problem that we give like qualitatively on a, on a test. Um, if you look at these IV curves, you should be able to tell qualitatively which one is a short channel MOSFET and which one is a long channel MOSFET. Okay, but, but, uh, if we didn't actually, you know, put the numbers there, <laughs> okay. All right, so um, let's review for a long channel MOSFET. The voltage at which the current saturates I'm going to just sort of sketch it out here. Threshold voltage. Okay, looking at okay, so looking at this curve on the right, what is approximately the threshold voltage? That's a good x, huh? Oh, 0.7. All right, fine. Okay, so then what what is this voltage here? What what is the saturation voltage there? Vd6. Huh? 0.3. Yes. Oh, wow, I drew it accurately. Okay. <laughs> All right, good. Point three. Now, how about here? At VGS is 1.5, what is the saturation voltage? Point VGS minus VT. So that's like point 0.8, right? Point 0.8. And this should be 1.3. So it's 1.8. So it should be about here. Okay. So the key here is that um, the current, if you connect all these dots together, and if you did this accurately, it would look like a quadratic curve, right? As the, as the saturation current, it's increasing quadratically with VGS minus VT. Okay. Now let's look at the, I'm not sure what to look at <laughs> here, but okay. So we can see um, qualitatively, you know, it's not, I'm going to just purposely draw a straight line. <laughs> it's more like a straight line, right? I mean, okay. So why is there? Why is it hard to see where this curve is saturating? I mean, just qualitatively. I know that's it doesn't flatten out. Very good. But why? <laughs> that's the question. Why doesn't the curve flatten out so nicely for a short channel device? Yes, Joe. Channel length modulation, exactly. There's more channel length modulation. Excellent. So that's good. So you have this, you know, it's 
proportional to lambda, right? The channel length modulation factor. So in a short channel device, that pinch off, the size of that pinch off region, that depletion region at the end of the channel, the inversion layer, um, is significant compared to the channel length. So as you go to higher and higher drain voltage above the saturation voltage, that pinch off region grows and shrinks the length of the inversion layer significantly. So that increases the lateral electric field as you increase VDS. So that's why, yeah, the slope, exactly. Yeah, so it's kind of hard to see where it saturates, but I'm just going to, okay, I'm going to, I don't know. All I know is, okay, it's supposed to be a straight line, so let's just do that. <laughs> um, so the saturation, yeah, let's just do this. So the saturation voltage is more like following a straight line rather than a quadratic. I mean, the saturation current is more a linear function of VGS compared to a long channel MOSFET. Okay? And so, okay, so the saturation voltage here you know, is close to one volt. Saturation vo voltage here for the same VGS minus VT is, well, it's not, sorry, it's not the same VGS minus VT, but the saturation voltage is um, larger, right, for a long channel device compared to a short channel device. Okay? All right, so, yeah, if you read p uh, modern um, papers on, let's say, an Intel's 45 nanometer to 32 nanometer generation technology, they'll sh typically show current versus drain voltage curves like this for N channel and P channel devices, and they'll also show the um, sub-threshold turn-on and turn-off characteristics. But you'll pretty much always see the curves not saturating very nicely and more evenly spaced. So these are even, um, you know, equal steps, right? You're increasing the gate voltage by half a volt for each of these curves. And the, this increment, right, this increment in saturation current is pretty much equal. But you can see here the increment in the saturation current is not the same even though you're increasing the gate voltage by the same amount, right? So you're increasing the gate voltage by half a volt from one curve to the next, but the current increase is clearly getting larger and larger, right? But here, the current increase is roughly the same, okay? All right. So in very short channel devices, um, there's something what we call velocity overshoot. So remember I mentioned that the current, I mean, sorry, the volt, Velocity actually reaches a maximum Vsat here. Well, it turns out that in a transistor, um, the velocity actually can go a little bit higher, can go significantly higher than the saturation velocity. Um, and this is called the, ph the phenomenon of velocity overshoot. Okay. So remember we talked about drift velocity, and that's just sort of an average velocity at which carriers are moving from, let's say, the source to the drain. And they're scattering many times in the process of going from drifting from the source to the drain. Now, when the channel length gets really small, there's higher and higher probability as the channel length gets smaller that a carrier can actually drift across the channel with, with no scattering event. Okay, so that actually isn't so common in a silicon device. But if a, if a electron does make it across the channel without scattering even once, this is what we call a ballistic transport. Okay, kind of projectile-like motion. So overall, if some percentage of your electrons actually make it across the channel without even drifting, I mean, without scattering once, then those velo the velocity of those ballistic trans uh, electrons will be higher than the V sat. So the average velocity of carriage flowing in a channel can actually exceed V sat. So you see this a little, uh, a little bit in, let's say, nanometer scale transistors. But typically, the what would be ballisticity, or th this factor is no more than 50%. Um, okay, so no more than 50% of the electrons in a modern nanometer scale transistor will, will um, undergo ballistic transport from the source to the drain. And so in this class, you maybe just qualitatively should know that in principle this can happen, but you won't need to you know, do any calculations to to actually determine what the, the overshoot velocity is, okay? All right, um, yeah. Okay, so any questions about velocity saturation? Okay, so the 
So this is a short, that sort of leads to one short channel effect in that you don't, you no longer increase the current as much as effectively as you increase the gate voltage. Okay. Okay. Now this is, this is un unfortunately another thing that we call the short. This is officially now the short channel effect that I'm going to talk about here. Okay. So SCE for short. So the short channel effect is also referred to as threshold voltage roll off, VT roll off. So it's actually yeah the magnitude of the threshold voltage decreases with the channel length, okay? And this effect is actually worse for higher VDS. So this is increased So qualitatively, um, okay, it's sort of hinted at uh, here at the bottom. But why do you think we would not want to have the threshold voltage decrease with the channel length? say here? Because invariant, yeah. Okay, so why do we want VT to be invariant? Yeah, I mean, yeah, so why do we want to have the same threshold voltage no matter what the, the transistor dimensions are? Um, hmm, okay. So let me put it this way. Okay, so a circuit designer, um, they actually, who, has people here taken like E141 or like this? Okay, so when you design a circuit, what, what are the things that a circuit designer can control? Bias points, okay, the voltage. And then you get to draw the size of the transistors, right? So you can draw, so a circuit designer can draw a circuit. You can actually specify the width of the channel, the length of the channel, and maybe you can determine what VDD is, right? And that's pretty much it. Um, so when you change the width, so when you adjust the W over L ratio of a transistor, you sort of expect that to change your drive current proportionately, right? Okay. So there's a simple, so if, you, if you're trying to design a circuit to achieve like some performance, um, you pretty much would like to keep it simple. Okay, as so you change the width over length, that's going to directly determine how much you're changing the drive current and how fast you're going to make that circuit operate. Okay, now if the threshold voltage is changing at the same time, it makes it really difficult for a circuit designer to accurately predict how fast or how slow their circuit's gonna work. Okay, so that's one thing you don't like. But in, okay, from a manufacturing or a device technology person standpoint, if you actually have a device, uh, let's say, so typically, um, as I mentioned, now, threshold voltage might be 0.2 volts. Uh, this is actually a really high drain voltage. But anyway, okay. So threshold voltage might be high, uh, 0.2 volts for high performance technology. Okay, so let's say that this is where, so, so you want to draw your transistors. Okay, so a circuit designer might draw a transistor with like one and a half micron channel length. Okay, but during the manufacturing process, okay, who, how many people here have taken EE143? Great, so in the manufacturing process, can you absolutely guarantee the length of your transistor is gonna be exactly one and a half micron? No, there's always gonna be some variations in the, because of lithography, you know, the photoresist exposure time and the etch, over etch and things like this. So in a manufacturing process, there are always going to be naturally be variations in the channel length and the width and so on. So due to process-induced variations, okay, if you know that your channel length can be controlled to maybe plus or minus 10%, you know, you don't want to have a transistor design that's very sensitive to variations in the manufacturing process. Okay, so basically, um, you don't want to have this threshold voltage dependence on channel length. Okay, so that's just basically the bottom line. So ideally, you'd, if, if possible, we'd like to have a flat uh, VT versus L curve. Okay, so a circuit designer can design transistors of any width and length they want and always be assured that the threshold voltage will be what they expect. Now remember, if the threshold voltage changes, if the, if the threshold voltage is too low, 
then that means your leakage current will be much, you know, exponentially higher than you expect, so that'll burn more power. If the threshold voltage is too high, then you slow down your circuit, and you might not meet the performance requirements. Okay? Okay, so what, uh, what causes this short channel effect? All right, so to form in this in, an inversion layer in the channel, we first had to um, deplete the surface of holes, right? So you have to apply a gate voltage high enough to deplete the surface of holes and uh, turn the surface into an n-type material. Okay. Um, but you have okay, so that's for an MOS capacitor. But now in an MOS transistor, you have these source and drain junctions, and the source and drain junctions have depletion regions. Okay, so remember, um, which side of the PN junction will have the most of the depletion region width? On the, on the lightly doped side, right? So actually, these heavily doped source and drain junctions are going to have most of the depletion region in the channel region, right? So in other words, these PN, these PN uh, source and drain PN junctions are already just by the, just, just because you have these N plus source and drain regions to the either side of the channel, you're already helping to deplete the channel region. So the gate, you don't have to apply as much threshold uh, gate voltage to deplete the channel in order to form the inversion layer. Okay, so the source and drain junctions are helping to invert the surface. So that's why the threshold voltage goes down, okay, um, as you decrease the channel length. So as the channel length gets, gets smaller, this, this, the impact of the source and drain depletion regions gets larger. So you get more and more reduction in threshold voltage as you scale down the channel length. Now, why does it get worse when you increase the drain voltage? So let's say the drain voltage is like more than one volt. Yeah, exactly. So this drain, if the higher the drain voltage, the more reverse biased your drain junction is. So when you have larger reverse bias, you have more depletion width, right? So the depletion width in the drain junction is larger, so the drain is actually helping to deplete more the channel region. Okay, so that's why the VT roll-off curve is worsened as you increase the drain voltage. So qualitatively, that's basically what happens. Okay, so that's what uh, is described on that slide. Okay, so um, pictorially, this is a simple sort of geometrical model. It's not perfectly accurate, of course, but just to help you understand. Um, so let's say that the source and drain regions, uh, junctions, they help to deplete the channel. So basically, to form an inversion layer under the channel, you have to deplete this region underneath the channel of holes. And um, so let's say that this portion here is actually supported by the source junction. And this portion here is actually depleted by the drain junction. So that means the gate only has to deplete this amount of, only has to support this amount of depletion charge. Okay. So if you have a long channel length, these depletion, this, the volume of these depletion regions is relatively small compared to the total amount of the depletion region, the total volume of the depletion region supported by the gate. But if you have short channel length, then actually it becomes significant. Okay, so simple geometric, ge geometrical model. Okay, so if we just want to come up with some nice simple equation to help us um, qualitatively understand how different design parameters affect the VT roll-off behavior, uh, we can do this. Um, basically, it's a simple yeah, geometrical model um, accounting, okay, so the key parameters are the junction depth, so how deep are the source and drain junctions? Okay, that will determine now, how deeply you know, these uh, depletion regions supported by the, by the um, source and drain junctions are, okay? So qualitatively, the shallower your source and drain junctions, um, the less they're going to help deplete the channel region. Um, the shorter your channel length, then the more significant the effect is. Okay, so you have to take that into account. Um, so this is a simple 45-degree kind of um, model here. So then, depending on the depth of the source and drain junctions, which is proportional to the radius of curvature of this source and drain junction, that's going to determine the length, this L prime, the length of the 
um, channel region between the depletion regions. Okay. Okay. So bottom line is you can come up with simple, this is like a geometrical model for this L prime. Okay. And that depends on the total depletion width depth as well as the junction depth of the source and vein regions. Okay, so bottom line is that the change in threshold voltage, okay, so, uh, hmm, this doesn't make sense. Okay, so the, you're going to reduce the magnitude. In each case, no matter if it's N channel or P channel, you're going to make it easier to turn on the device. So the magnitude of your threshold voltage will decrease due to this short channel effect. Okay, so this, this um, sig delta VT is just a de the amount of decrease in the magnitude of your threshold voltage. Well, actually, well, it is negative. Okay, so it's negative. Um, so it depends on a, a bunch of factors, okay, that are derived in this geometrical model. But quality, all you have to know is qualitatively, okay. Maybe for the homework you'll do some simple calculation, but for the exams, just be able to explain qualitatively. Um, how do we minimize this threshold voltage uh, reduction as a function of channeling? Okay, so looking at this equation, uh, we can increase C ox equivalent, okay, the equivalent oxide capacitance to minimize this uh, delta VT. So this means you want to reduce the oxide thickness. Okay? So that means you make the gate voltage more effective in modulating the channel surface potential so that the gate um, is more strongly going to affect the channel surface potential compared to the source and drain um, voltages. Um, you can make the source and drain junctions shallower, okay? So you make these these triangles shorter, okay? Um, you can increase the dopant concentration in the channel, so you can decrease the total depletion width, okay? In the source and drain junctions, right? Did you have a question? Really? Yeah. Um, okay. So. The other question is if Na increases, then delta Vt increases. But actually, um, Wt also decreases, and this also decreases. But overall, um, yeah, okay, so practically, this is, okay. So maybe from this equation you can't tell, but practically what happens is, okay, this is a little confusing. But if we, if we dope the channel more heavily, then naturally that also causes the junction depths to be more shallow because, okay, where, where is this junction actually defined to be? It's basically, well, yeah, the N-type dopant concentration equals the P-type dopant concentration. That's where the metallurgical junction is. So if you increase the P-type dopant concentration, then basically these junctions will be shallower also. So in practice, yeah, from this equation, I agree, it's hard to see that, you know, increasing the doping in the channel is going to actually reduce the VT roll-off effect. But in practice, it does because it decreases the width of the depletion region, but also, in practice, decreases the junction depth. So that's a good question. Um, but this is not something that we'd like to do too heavily because if we increase the dopant concentration in the channel, then that degrades on-state performance. The effective mobility de is degraded, and this body... Um, effect factor M goes up. But bottom line is that, you know, this is the reason as we scale down the lateral dimensions of the transistors to increase performance and to fit more transistors per unit area, you know, all of these things that we're doing here, we're also s scaling down the vertical dimensions, okay? So, so not only the oxide thickness, you know, has to be scaled down, but the junction depth and the depletion depth also has to be scaled down. Okay, I think... Okay, so a couple of extra, oh, I forgot. So a couple of extra things that come into play when, when you go to very short channel lengths. So as um, I think it was Joe that mentioned, uh, at very short channel lengths, we can start to see this um, sloped. So if you plot the drain current versus the drain voltage, you start, I'm going to exaggerate, you start to see a significant slope in the, in the current versus the drain voltage, in the saturation regime. Okay, so let me just sketch it here. Plot drain current versus drain voltage. Now, normally, it should saturate 
but let's say in a very short channel device, it, does, it doesn't actually saturate. Okay, so let's say in a short channel device, let's call this a real short channel device. Um, why does the current, or wh what, what happens at the saturation voltage? Uh, reaches maximum velocity, uh, Vsat, that's right. Okay, so, so this happens. So, okay, I guess my point is that in a short channel device, you reach the saturation regime before you pinch off the channel. Does that make sense? Okay. So in a, short, in a really short channel device, the current will naturally saturate because of um, velocity saturation, and it will not pinch off first, okay? So, but you still see a significant slope. Okay, so the so the, on this slide, this is this is the explanation why. Okay, so the reason is because the slope, and therefore we still call it lambda. Okay, is now not due to um, channel length modulation. So technically, we're not. Well, yeah, we're not really modulating the length of the inversion layer. It's due to drain-induced barrier lowering. Okay, Dibble. So what happens is that, okay, so remember when a transistor is off, typically in a digital logic circuit, is the drain to source voltage large or small? Large, right? When a transistor is off, it's trying to hold off a large voltage. Okay, so when you look at the current on a log scale versus the gate voltage, um, the, the, and you want to see how much leakage current is flowing, it, you, you should look at that uh, with high drain to source voltage. Okay. Um, so in this, in these energy band diagrams, basically there's a significant drain to source voltage, right? That's why the conduction band edges are at different levels. Okay. In the off state here. So in the off state, um, remember the source potential barrier, right? In the, when the transistor's off, the gate is biased to sort of increase the electron potential. So you have this potential barrier height to carriers diffusing into the channel region, okay? Now, if the, if the channel is short, okay, if the source and drain junctions are coming close together, actually, um, and you have a large drain voltage, that drain voltage now can, the energy band bending, you know, in, in the drain junction can start to affect, okay, this, this usually happens like away from the surface, like maybe a little bit below the surface in this region here, like in the, in the body region. Um, because of the drain to source voltage, you can actually lower this potential barrier height at the source, okay? So if you're lowering the potential barrier at the source because of the drain voltage, um, you're making it easier for the gate to turn on this transistor, right? So you don't need as much gate voltage to turn on this transistor. Does that make sense? So you don't need to apply as much gate voltage to lower that potential barrier to allow carriers to diffuse into the channel. So in other words, the threshold voltage is being affected by the drain voltage. Okay, so drain-induced barrier lowering just means that the threshold voltage is decreasing um, as you increase the drain to source voltage. Does that make sense? And what that does is it increases your off-state leakage, right? Because you're shifting this curve to the left with increasing drain voltage. So at, at zero, oops, yeah, so at zero volts on the gate, you know, the current, the off-state leakage current is increasing exponentially. But bottom line, in the on-state, so this is the impact of drain-induced barrier lowering on off-state leakage, right? You're increasing the off-state leakage exponentially. But the impact on on-state current is that, um, so remember, ID sat is proportional to VG minus VT to some power, eta, okay, between one and two. So as you're increasing the drain voltage, you're decreasing the threshold voltage, and so your current goes up. Okay, so this slope here, this this uh, slope in the saturation regime is diff is due to different effects, for for short channel versus long channel devices. For long channel devices, it's due to pinch off and the channel length modulation effect. For short channel devices, is due to drain induced barrier lowering. Okay, it's the fact that VT, um, not L, is chain is is decreasing as you increase the drain voltage. Um, 
So remember last time we talked about the small signal model, and I mentioned that the slope here, which determines the, um, you know, the output conductance, GD, is the change in drain current for given change in drain voltage. Um, that's going to be, I mean, we want this to be as small as possible for the high, ampli you know, high current gain. Anyway, so this is bad, basically. Right? So this slope is bad for um, amplification purposes. But the slope, this, this dibble is also bad for digital logic applications because it, it increases your standby power consumption, right? Because off-state leakage is increasing exponentially. Okay, so it's bad for analog circuits and it's bad for digital circuits, the strain-induced barrier lowering. Okay, so qualitatively, I don't think you mentioned, yeah. Okay, how, well, how would you minimize this drain-induced barrier lowering? How, how do we minimize the impact of this drain, you know, depletion region on the source, uh, essentially it was the source depletion region. Yeah, you want to have more heavily doped materials, right? So the more heavily doped middle region you have here in the P-type region, um, uh, well, the more heavily doped this P-type center region is, the, um, the smaller the depletion width, right? The more heavily doped the PN junction is, the, the smaller the depletion width. So then, okay, let me just sketch it. So let's just compare. So let's say this is, the band diagram looking at the conduction band edge going from the source to the drain, to M plus source to the M plus drain, okay? So if you make the channel more light, heavily doped, then first of all, the barrier should be, the depletion width should be narrower and the barrier should be a little bit higher, all right? And then, and then the, yeah. Right, so the, the width of the depletion, I'm just exaggerating here, the width of the depletion region um, is gonna be narrower Right, so th basically, the strain-induced barrier lowering um, will be will will be mitigated. Okay, basically, this only happens because deep in, deep beneath the the surface, the depletion regions of the drain and the source are starting to merge a little bit. Okay, because as you get farther and farther away from the um, surface, remember it's, it becomes more and more p-type, so uh, and it's depleted. So anyway, so qualitatively. Just remember that more heavily doping the body will help to reduce drain-induced drain barrier lowering, okay? Drain-induced barrier lowering, or dibble for short. Ah, so the, that's a good question. So I'm gonna mention on the next slide. So um, all these questions, is, okay, do we wanna dope it more at the bottom or the top? And in fact, you want to dope it more heavily. I mean, you only need to do this um, further away from the channel surface, because basically the strain-induced barrier lowering effect is most severe as you go away from the surface. Um, and so you actually want to have more heavily doped body region away from the surface. At the very surface where the inversion layer forms, you want to have higher mobility, so you, so you kind of don't want such heavy doping at the surface, if possible. So the strain-induced barrier lowering is mitigated if you have heavy doping a little bit away from the surface of the channel. All right, so this last slide. So punch through is actually just drain-induced barrier lowering to the extreme in which, as I mentioned, so beneath the surface of the channel, the depletion regions, um, as you increase the drain voltage, the depletion width you know, of this reverse bias drain junction increases, and so now you get the depletion regions merging, and uh, you can have current flowing now because this uh, electric field applied, right, from the attracting electrons from the source to the drain and they can just go flow right through the depletion region if the potential barrier is low enough. They, you have significant diffusion and, and drift, okay. Diffusion of the barrier and drift across the uh, depletion region from the source to the drain of carriers. So then, so this, this is what happens at very high drain voltages. You start to see this steep increase in current with an increase in drain voltage. So this is what we call punch through. So in a short channel device, so this is not super short, 
in a, in a short channel device, or sorry, in a long channel device, it'll, it'll be more um, abrupt, this kind of punch through effect. In a short channel device, you know, you already see some significant slope even before you reach punch through. So um, if you, let's see. I, yeah, so punch through can, you know, just become steeper and steeper like this. Okay, more, more gradual transition at dr very high drain voltages to punch through. Okay, so um, the, the graduate students, um, and for the homework, I think this next week, um, you, it's a standard homework problem to look at a MOSFET with a retrograde doping profile. So in other words, you're looking at, so here's the depth. Oops. Nope. The depth versus, um, I'm sorry, the dopant concentration versus depth. Let's do that. So if we plot the dopant concentration, let's say NA versus depth, ideally we'd like it to be something like like this, right? So, um, so it's heavy away from the surface and it's light near the surface. Okay, so it's heavy away from the surface to try to increase the doping concentration in this region to reduce the width of the depletion regions so it won't punch through, right? So notice that punch through occurs you know, well, beno well beneath the surface of the silicon. So that's, that's the only place you need heavy doping. At the surface where the inversion layer forms, you don't really want heavy doping because that will degrade your effect, field effect mobility, okay? So ideal, this is what we call retrograde doping, that the dopant concentration is light near the surface and then it increases pretty steeply beneath the surface to some higher level to mitigate, to, to reduce the depletion widths of the source and drain junction, okay? So the industry is actually slowly moving to getting doping profiles like this, um, these uh, super steep retrograde doping profiles specifically to suppress you know, short channel effects such as Dibble and the VT roll off effect. So this is actually relevant and that's the, that's the doping profile that the, you, this, this um, the graduate students will have to optimize for the design project. For the undergrads, you can just assume it's uniformly doped <laughs> body, okay? All right, any questions about qualitatively about short channel effects? Okay, so next time I think, okay, we're gonna talk about, so this is talking about the effect of the body, and so next time we'll talk about optimizing the source and drain um, structure design. And I think after that, then we talk about advanced transistor structures, okay? Okay, so let's see, for today's social, I think it's the department chair will, will be joining us today, answering any questions you might have for him. <laughs> All right, so I hope to see you there. <laughs>